Joe. <clears throat> All right. So everyone's got pizza and beer, hopefully, right? Um, I, I, I kind of said it earlier. Uh, we didn't have a speaker this month, so I threw this together. It's going to be a little uh, on the fly. But I think I have a bunch of good information to share. So what we're talking about, um, we've been doing a whole bunch of talks about React, and I'm sure everybody's played with it or tried it out, and there's um, a lot of ways to get started. And mostly what I'm going to focus on here is kind of navigating through all that stuff. Um, but I'm going to start off and say there are a bunch of boilerplate and generators. Um, and there's really good times to use these. So I just I just made some really quick examples here. If you're doing server side, I, I personally wouldn't start out on my own. I would definitely look at Next.js or one of the newer frameworks is called Razzle. Uh, these are you know these types of frameworks are going to be much more prescriptive, but they're going to get rid of a lot of the headache and, and decision making process bullshit that you have to deal with when you're architecting it on your own. If you're doing a static site. Gatsby is the new WordPress. It pretty much wins hands down at this point. I don't know if there is another static site generator that really compares to them any longer. Uh, in terms of the community and the growth and the, the ecosystem that's grown up around it and all its different uses, if you're just doing a component or creating your own library, there's something called NWB, which I, I recently, I, I had learned about a while back, I recently visited it specifically for this purpose. Uh, and it holds up really well. It kind of gives you an environment and lets you kind of kick out your code without it being wrapped up in uh, uh, like its own application, which is how you might quickly develop a component today. What's up? Was not paying attention. You did it record, right? Nope. Jesus. <laughs> That's right. The only thing I've done so far is move from one. Uh, well, now you have to start again. Yeah, that's okay. No, 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 no. Oh, we're fine. Give me a second. The only thing I did is move from that point to that point. The camera's got everything else. I can recreate that shit. <laughs> <laughs> shit <right>. it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, NWB is really cool for a component library, or a component or a library if you're working on something like that. Um, and then there's Create React App. <clears throat> Everybody loves Create React App. It is. It's awesome. You just fire it up and you're good to go. Um, and I've got some wins on that too. Prototyping, absolutely, no doubt about it. Just fire up, create React app and go to work. Side project or something you're just working on on your own, 100%, I would say, if any of these situations apply to you or your project or the current state of your project or if you can get away with using one of these, do it. Uh, these are all awesome libraries for kickstarting a project. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I'm a huge fan of all of these. However, uh, I do think, especially with Create React App, uh, on a larger application, on a larger team of people, you are going to outgrow it. Um, it's very much prescribed to you what you're going to use, and anything outside of that, you're on your own or you'll find some weird flavor of it. <coughs> Somebody somewhere has create React app working with, you know, well now it works with TypeScript, but somebody created one that works with TypeScript. Somebody made one that's got a couple tweaks so you don't have to set up MobX or, or whatever you might want to do. There's probably some little flavor of it, but all of a sudden you're kind of outside of that Facebook React core team love and you're on your own. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about, but I did want to make sure that I am not ruling out any of those uh, any of those libraries or, or frameworks that I just talked about. Those are all amazing tools. Uh, but what we're going to talk about is custom configuration. Um, yeah, and this is where my talk starts to fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Well Thanks for well coming. Well yeah. <laughs> so I, I kind of broke it in. This, this chart is huge. I broke it down into like these four blue categories. That's why you need a scroll wheel. Yeah. So I call it development stack, application core, interface, <coughs> it's probably the lightest of these, and then performance and debug. And that's not to say that I, I couldn't have broken out into more or that I'm skipping certain <coughs> parts of this process. And this isn't really going to be me telling you like, hey, use this library, use that library. I am going to show you some of my choices, but it's more about all the shit you have to figure out along the way. Uh, and a lot of this is uh, cumulative. So like as you move through this little path that I'm going to show you, 
making a change on that step four means going all the way back in and adding in a, a new Webpack loader or a new Babel plugin or something like that. Um, but we're going to start with bare bones, which is what I'm calling the dev and build config. <clears throat> um, there's other things you can use, but what I've got here is Webpack rollup and parcel. Uh, I have zero experience with rollup. I know it's super lightweight. A lot of people like it. I, my understanding is it's, it's mostly used for uh, more like libraries to, to compile their libraries, not necessarily for compiling a full uh, uh, you know, service uh, or uh, single page application. Um, so that one I can't really comment on, but I think Webpack at the moment is kind of the winner. I mean, we went from gr gr uh, Grunt back in the day, and we had a few little bits and pieces, Broccoli and some other guys, Brunch, I think Brunch was one, where everything was configuration. <clears throat> and then for like just a brief and glorious moment, we had Gulp, and we could use JavaScript for that stuff, and then we went back to configuration. So we're back to the configuration, which is Webpack. <clears throat> Webpack's great. <clears throat> it does a lot. It's not always the easiest thing to manage. <clears throat> And with that, uh, for this dev and build config, we, we certainly want to have kind of all those nice little things you get with some of those other frameworks that I was talking about, live reload, and, uh, uh, and, and for that we're going to need Webpack dev server, and we're going to need various loaders, which are just different ways to load in certain types of files. So I do have some code to show. I am going to fire up our amazing app. That should work. I'll make sure you guys get this copy. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> so this is my app. I would say that uh, originally when I did this, I came up with just a button that you click and it tells you how many times you clicked it. And I was like, this is not just stupid. It's horribly trivial <laughs> and it's not going to work. So I came up with a stupid app that's slightly less trivial. It's still, it's super dumb though. So there are all these scientific <coughs> sounding looking things that uh, are unrelated in every regard. Because <laughs> just, it's just an alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on. So you select a bunch of this stuff and you're going to click confirm configuration. <coughs> it's going to go through this crazy awesome algorithm to figure out science and then it just picks uh, whatever trending GIF is on Jiffy or Giphy or whatever you want to call it. And for whatever reason, uh, our, our product here also, all that stuff at the bottom that's showing us our configuration will update as we change it. So that's our app, right? <clears throat> so this is my package JSON. Everyone here familiar with package JSON? Yes, no? Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Um, this is bare bones. <clears throat> I've got prop types, which is my, I, I, I'm gonna mention some type checking stuff, but that's what I'm using for type checking for the most part. I've got React and React DOM, since that's our environment. <clears throat> I've got uh, what's essentially the, the React hot loader. Um, and then I've got a few uh, uh, just kind of common no-brainer uh, Webpack plugins, um, case sensitive paths, because you know, you're working on a Mac or something that's not case sensitive. You push it to uh, you know a Linux environment, and all of a sudden your stuff doesn't work. So we'll just catch that up front. Um, Terser Webpack plugin uh, it replaces Uglify JS plugin. Don't use Uglify JS anymore; it's not supported. Nobody's maintaining it. It's falling apart. Terser's awesome, and then Webpack the CLI, the dev server, and I'm using something called Webpack Merge, which uh, just lets you uh, have kind of like a common Webpack configuration and then merge it so then like well, something that's going to be shared between my development configuration and my production configuration I can just uh, share that between them instead of having to write up you know copy all the crap over so here's my comment again this is super bare bones uh, you know I've got an entry point uh, you know and I've got, I've got a few plugins that are going to be common to both of these environments I've got my development environment which we're running right now uh, so I'm merging in this common guy this is all really bare bones, simple stuff just to get it up and running. There's nothing super special going on in here. Uh, I've got an index HTML, and with the Webpack plugin down there, the HTML Webpack plugin, I just inject my JavaScript into that HTML. Uh, and this little environment variable is just a bit to show 
like I do like to have a way to grab environment variables from you know when when I'm running web webpack. Sometimes you're using that to inject stuff into the HTML or whatever. But again, this is I would call this like a bare minimum setup. There's nothing super complicated that you couldn't uh, learn or pick up very very quickly from <coughs> a dozen examples. And this is my uh, development version. Again, I'm bringing in the common, and uh, this is the one where I am in fact using Tercer, <coughs> your which is a version. What's that? Your production. This is the production version. So this will make a uh, more optimized bundle, kind of uglify all the, uh, you know, mangle all the keywords and stuff like that. And um, it'll also split it out into two bundles for now. An app one, which is my code, and then a vendor one, which is React and whatever else I might bring in. So like, again, I would consider this the, uh, the bare minimum. Like, and again, it, it, there's just not much here. And the result of that is this guy, right? So it's working. If I make a change, it'll live reload. All of that's awesome. Uh, and, I, and I can show you the, the production build, but it's, it's actually less important to this talk. What I want to do is show you really quickly. I got to lean in because for you guys, that's kind of small. For me, that's like tiny. Um, this is my index file, pretty standard React setup. I'm just bringing in React DOM, I'm bringing in a single component, and then I'm rendering my uh, component. And this is my awesome component. Uh, blow this up for you guys, because some of you are going to love this. So uh, this is our step one, and I did a really awesome thing. I got everything to live inside of one file. So here's a whole bunch of crap to get all that stuff on the screen and how I'm configuring everything. Here's all my styles in my file, just in a JSON file. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, here's a loader component. I'm using all the latest stuff. I got use state in here, you know. Uh, I think I'm using use effect somewhere. Here's a bunch of use state. That's the new hotness. Uh, and then everyone's, anyone who's doing React is going to start to notice something. Uh, here's here's my markup. Oh, yeah, baby. All in one file. No, no, no. This is awesome. Right? Yeah. I have no yeah. fucking idea how painful that was. No JSX for you. Okay, why yeah. is React better? What's that? <laughs> I know, right? You get to write more code. <laughs> yeah, you write more code. <laughs> you build by the line. <laughs> so, and then down here, I'm doing this little. Uh, if, if you haven't used React Hot Loader, that's what I'm doing down here. It's. Uh, I'm just wrapping it so that I get hot loading. Uh, the, the difference between just exporting it without this, because Webpack will actually do live reload for you. Um, let me just see if I can demonstrate this really quick. So I don't think I really need to bother with this, but I just want to let you know right up front. The difference here is, uh, oh man, I gotta find something to change. <laughs> uh, we'll change this button. Uh, okay, so there's the app. And so right now, if I change this, it should reload on the side, right? So that's cool. But what we're missing without the uh, wrapping it in that little hot module thing is uh, when I change this, I've lost all my state, right? All the little check boxes that I had checked off are all gone every time I make a change and that, uh, that sucks. And a lot of this, a lot of my decision-making process around this tends to be around teams and it really tends to be around developer experience. And I know if I don't like something, nobody else is gonna like it over some amount of time, something that's a pain in the ass. So uh, what you can see is I make a change right now and I lose anything I did because it's a full reload, right? So we're using this groovy little guy with the React Hot Loader. And then now if I make a change, we keep all our state. Right, so the button updated there. I don't know if you saw that. But my state remained the same. So that's why we use that. <clears throat> and it's just a very nice thing to have for any developer. Okay, so we've got Webpack and we've got React. Uh, clearly we're missing some things. Um, I, I'm pretty sure somebody said JSX, right? <laughs> Everyone know what JSX is? JSX is an HTML-like syntax <coughs> that gets compiled to this stuff. 
Um, so we want that good stuff, right? So uh, this is the next step of the uh, thing here, right? Transpiling. So we're still in the dev and build stuff. So transpiling, I don't even know if there is another option. We're, we're going to use Babel, right? And then we're also going to look at, and I don't know if you call it transpiling, but we were just talking about earlier, like processing of CSS. <clears throat> but we're going to jump in with Babel first. And if you don't know what Babel is, it compiles JavaScript to JavaScript. So you take a version of JavaScript and compile it to another version of JavaScript. Um, and it comes with a bunch of plugins. And uh, it's also the thing that's kind of allowing us to use future JavaScript right now. Um, and, and a lot of those things nowadays, like once we get them in our hands, they become so invaluable that we know that's going to become part of the stack. So um, I'm just going to switch. <coughs> Did you write all? Did you write all those React create elements by hand, or did you do the JSX and then put it in Babel? Uh, like a little, a little bit of both. Oh, the Babel didn't work perfectly for me, and I think that's well because I don't have Babel installed at that point. Hmm. So there were certain things that <clears throat> the transpiler was doing for me that just weren't working. So it took a lot. This thing has been so goddamn hard to like debug, <laughs> and it's a testament to like the further along I get to this. There's a point in this thing where uh, one of the changes I'll, I'll try to remember to point it out to you is like I didn't even realize this was a problem until I got all the way to this point. Like, and I could look at it in like like Redux Dev Tools or something because I just if you don't have that information at hand and you're looking at 500 lines of React create element. It's very hard to find anything, and we haven't gotten to. There's no linting in this thing or anything yet. Uh, so I am going to cheat and load up source tree because I think it'll give us a nice little look at um, what might have changed because I don't remember. <laughs> All right. So and I, I can't actually zoom this in for some reason. Um, but I'm just going to, uh, we'll take a look at the code, but I just want to let you know, I added a, a Babel RC file, which is a configuration file for a tool called Babel. Um, I added a handful of packages, including the Babel core and, and the things that we need for Babel to run. But I also went through, I don't know, everyone here using Babel to some degree? Anyone still using stage presets? Does anyone know? <laughs> so they had stage presets, but now they're being deprecated. So you need to go in and actually look at all the uh, uh, plugins available, and more specifically, look at all the proposal plugins that are available. Um, these are a handful that I am mostly in love with, especially things like optional chaining. Like once you get, the, if you guys don't know what that is, it's like uh, in TypeScript they have the Elvis operator, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's the Elvis operator, but it works in JavaScript. So that's uh, <clears throat> how do you describe that? Uh, I don't have to. This isn't a talk about that. It's <coughs> like Lodash get if you ever use Lodash get Sure, sure. Same thing. Uh, so I've got a bunch of uh, minor things. I do have uh, a couple presets in here that are not stage presets. Uh, one for React, which is really just a collection of plugins for uh, the JSX transpilation and some sort of transform, some other thing. I don't know. I, I shouldn't tell you you should know what's in your preset and then tell you I don't know what's in your preset. <laughs> uh, pipeline operator, just a lot of good stuff. But, but this is part of the job of architecting a project for a team. <clears throat> I mean, there have been things that were Babel proposals or plugin. They were TC39 proposals that became Babel plugins and then didn't make it. Uh, object out of observe. Aurelia, the framework Aurelia was built entirely on the promise of object.observe, and then they got rid of object.observe. So the framework, I mean, it's actually doing OK now, but it kind of fell apart for a minute. Uh, <clears throat> so you need to know about this stuff. You need to know what plugins you're using from Babel. A lot of these other tools that we talked about earlier, they're taking that out of your control. They've made that decision for you, and they've probably made very good decisions. When you're making it on your own, you need, you need to make good decisions, too. <laughs> Uh, so the rest of this is just some updates to uh, to the actual code. So first and foremost, we now have JSX. So this is much nicer than, than what we had previously. Yeah, I still have a lot of shit. It's still all in one file. Don't worry. <laughs> Great. 
so we added in all our all our stuff here, and just really quickly to point out in my common, I now have this rule: how to parse JavaScript in my Webpack, and I say run it through the Babel loader, and then the rest of it just kind of automatically connects up to the little Babel RC that I have in there, and uh, and now we've got all this good stuff, right? But I'm looking at the Babel RC here, and I will point out that all of these plugins aren't generally just type it in there and you're good to go. <clears throat> At the proposal stage, sometimes you have three or four versions of a plugin, and uh, with uh, the pipeline operator, we have like a strict, minimal, uh, an F sharp version. There's a, like, depending on what you type in that proposal field, you will get a very different version of that proposal. So everything in here, you, you kind of have to do a little reading on. You got to see if it actually feels right. Uh, you kind of got to bet on it. Like, is this good enough that I think, or look at the community, like what does the community think about, go read the issues about it, see where, if it's moved through the stages of TC39. <clears throat> but that's it, so now we have, uh, at the end of the day, you know, we have uh, JSX now, we can use JSX, which is clearly much better than uh, what we were doing. So we are gonna jump over to our chart again. And we're going to talk about CSS. <coughs> so right now, just so everyone remembers, here's my CSS. I just I just made a bunch of I just made a JSON object with all the CSS, and I'm just plugging in this wherever I want, or, or into the components. <coughs> and that's is that CSS and JS? <laughs> I mean, wow. I mean, at its core, it kind of is. And, and so. According to VS Code, you were making this shit up at lunchtime. <laughs> at lunchtime? Yeah, it says six hours ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's pretty true. <laughs> but I'm not working right now, so it's not really lunchtime. Uh -huh. That's breakfast. <laughs> oh, screw you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, when it comes to CSS, like at this very moment, um, it's kind of my only option unless I want to write like a separate CSS file and stick it in the index.html. Uh, I don't think I can just import CSS into my JavaScript right now or anything. Um, so I, I need to make a decision, like how do I want to manage uh, style sheets, right? How do I want to manage my styles? And you have like the big options. Less and SAS are certainly the biggest ones. Uh, I think I lean towards uh, uh, less, but SAS is probably the predominant one. Um, you have a ton of different CSS and JS <laughs> solutions, specifically around React. I think uh, the hotness now is Emotion, maybe? Is that? Is that oh, really? It was yeah. Style Components for a while. Style yeah, Components yeah. are still big, yeah. I think uh, Glamour is, is, is now saying, like, nah, just use Emotion. Oh, really? um, <clears throat> so I've had some downtime recently, and, I, and I've been using less forever. <clears throat> I've certainly used SAS a bunch, uh, but I really decided to explore this, and the answer is post CSS. Like, I have no doubt about it. <coughs> Everybody should be using post CSS. Uh, Specifically with uh, this plugin, post CSS env preset. Hopefully, I didn't do that backwards. Uh, it's it's basically Babel. I mean, it's got stages uh, based on uh, at least a website called the CSSdatabase.com or db.com. Um, so you can pick your stage. You can pick certain rules. It'll automatically set up polyfills for you. Uh, you previously with post CSS, you just had like a massive plugin. This kind of does it all for you, for the most part. Um, there's also something called pre-CSS if you really need to hang on to kind of SAS style variable naming and some of that stuff, it'll it'll just give you that. <coughs> um, so we're gonna take a quick look at this. I was gonna this say, pass the chair, but I just don't hit the camera. Or, or Jason. Sorry, so <laughs> it's necessary. We just, uh, <laughs> that's really interesting. Okay, so let's take a really quick look at what did I change? So, some new packages, uh, uh, a new loader for, for Babel, two loaders, a, a CSS loader that will load the file in for us, and then a post CSS loader that will transpile that file for us, um, and then a handful of plugins. Uh, uh, the, the one that I just mentioned, the preset end, uh, and one that fixes some sort of bug they have in Flexpox. That I didn't even check. I was like, oh, you have this thing that fixes that bug. I'll just install that. Uh, it may or may not be needed at this point. But a few packages. And then uh, what I was able to do, here's our component again. Uh, now, now my CSS is 
is in a CSS file. And my preference is to put it directly next to the component. And you can see, like, this is really just CSS, just so you know. Um, but nesting is probably coming to CSS. And so you can turn that on in post CSS with that plugin that I was talking about, which is really all I did here, with one exception. Uh, I did this little config value color in a var, which is part of CSS now, or will be, but I don't know if it's widely supported in browsers. Um, but all I, you know, it, it, so my, my point about post CSS is you do get, I think, all of the power. You can't have all the power of something like less or SAS, um, but you, you can also just work very close to the metal and, and learn CSS instead of learning less or SAS. Uh, and a lot of these things that we've all loved about less or SAS are, are finally making their way to CSS. So it's a great time to get to know it again. What's up? I actually have a serious question. I only saw it believe. <laughs> and now I don't believe you. <laughs> I, I use, and I've got an honest answer. Are you saying post CSS is better because you're a JavaScript boy that loves JavaScript? Or is it actually better? <clears throat> I think it is the best decision anyone building a new <coughs> JavaScript application could make. So, from a JavaScript developer's perspective, it's better. But from a designer's perspective, oh, from a designer's perspective, it's great. What do we? We don't give a shit about designers. <laughs> Just give us the colors. We'll turn it into less or SAS or post CSS or whatever we want. Yeah, really. Yeah. Just because our applications are seventy-five percent JavaScript, we're people too. You architect, huh? An architect. No, but no, I mean, it, 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 why, why is it better? Because I know you have time. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I'm saying it's better because you can get everything you want out of it that you can get out of less and SAS. Plus. And you can get closer to uh, the future of CSS. You can use real CSS. There's a lot of things coming to CSS, and now there's this, much like with ECMAScript, we have the stages, right? Zero through four. Is four even a stage, or is that just, it's in? Zero Either way, yeah, I think um, we're, that type of structure is now becoming available for CSS. So there are proposals. Those proposals mm -hmm. are moving through stages. At a certain stage, those proposals are going to become a part of the language. And just like Babel is in, not informing, but kind of moving JavaScript forward, I, I think post CSS, in, in particular, this this awesome plugin that they put together is doing the exact same thing. Just tell us what you want to use from the known stuff that people are actually trying to turn into standards. Right. Not from some other language or Ruby or whatever the hell is going on over there. This is actually CSS that is likely, depending on which stage you're at, to become supported by the browser. Which means over time, just like with JavaScript, we, we need less and less of these plugins, less and less of this transpiling. And, uh, and you know the browsers just begin to support it. Same thing with uh, uh, like the Babel preset, and you can say like, hey, I want to support these browsers. Yeah, okay. And then it doesn't bother transpiling for IE4, IE5, or whatever you tell it. Like, I'm not worried about those, and so we don't need to waste any time or or build up a whole bunch of code to make it work okay. in ES friggin' three or whatever. So then, so then a practical question. Is it fast? It's like your third, so you're done no, for the no, night. No, 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 because this, this is actually, you you this, no, and I do care, because if you sit here and say this is the greatest thing ever, I want to know why. Is it more performant than a CSS file? Because you're putting it in the JavaScript. It, it has the, to be processed. Okay, so, so if, if, if you're uh, creating, uh, again, with a React application or using Webpack, if you're creating uh, an application, you're probably doing something very similar to this with less or SAS files. Because it's going to bundle it. You're bringing them in. Yeah, and then you've got something that's going to pull it all together for you. And you also have the ability, obviously, to create source maps. And uh, you can split that stuff up, too. So it's, it's a, it is actually going to build the CSS. It's not going to create a JavaScript file and build it on the fly. No, 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 no. This. The output of my application right now is a, uh, I mean, it's a little more than just a file. But <coughs> You will see I have a CSS file here. This is the output, right? I've just got it. I'm using that uh, <laughs> CSS Nano. So it's all compressed, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so oh, yeah. It's well, still it's easy to read. In, the still common, CSS, though. in the common, for whatever reason, I just put all my post CSS in there, and I'm actually That's using fun, CSS right. Nano to right. munge it together. But what I will say is uh, 
I have source maps for my CSS. So if I come over here oh, and sweet. find something that's got a class. Yeah. Come on, something out a class. Oh, this has a class. Um, I can see that it's in fact, and you can see the difference there. I don't know if you can read it really well, but you see how it's capital app dot CSS. Right. It's it's telling me that it's coming from that. Now my, my compiled version also has to be happens to be app dot CSS, but it's lowercase. So it, there is a difference. And when I click on that guy, yes, because of the way I set this up. No, 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 no. no. Because of the way I set it up, it's <laughs> compressing it. I didn't have to do that. I, I did it for for brevity here. But as soon as I expand it, it did take me directly that, to the line. And it nuts. could have taken me to the individual file. But in my comments, so both in develop and production, I'm munching it all together. Uh, technically, I would not do that if it became a problem. I would say, no, I, wanna, I want all the separate right. files where you know, I, I, I don't want to see it compressed. I want to see its original format. Uh, but in this case, I'm saying, just shove it all into a file. We're good. Brilliant. OK. Thank you. So this would allow you to do things like grid and not oh, have to yeah, worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think like IE 11 started to support it, but. Oh, as far as like <coughs> polyfilling grid, I yeah. would look at it. You're right. You're, it's a very, so I would say just like with uh, ES6 on, like almost everything is polyfillable except for a few things. <laughs> <laughs> Grid's pretty serious stuff. So. What's that? Grid's pretty serious stuff. I'm sorry. But there may be a polyfill. Yeah, I, I would say like they have a giant list of stuff you can tap into. I think it really depends on what browser you're talking about, though, because like once it's like, I, I mean, now that Edge is Chromium, uh, like in the next month or so, I know they've already got like a Canary release of it. That's uh, I mean, everybody gets great. It's over. It's over. <laughs> Yay! You know me. Joe Firefox just put a subgrid. Subgrid? Yeah. I don't think I've heard of it. So, so you can do so hotness for grid. You can do grids, and then you can do like independent grids within as well. Like they're not gonna, they're gonna be on different tracks and so. Huh. so you can really do crazy. You can not really do some crazy shit to see a grid. Well, you're gonna be able to do. Uh, <laughs> I've taken like a moving. whole mess of yeah. flexbox and turn in like five lines or eight lines of CSS grid and been like, wow, and still not fully understood what I just did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's certainly something we all should be working towards, like really understanding grid and figuring out which parts of it we don't need. Kind of like there's some Flexbox stuff that you, you really focus on learning every bit of it, and then you realize, like, I use like four of these all the time, and the rest of them I don't really touch. Um, OK. so. I'm recommending Toast CSS, but obviously the, the point here is you know you need some sort of CSS solution. What I was doing, even though it was awesome that I had everything in one file, uh, it's I, I do believe you should separate your style from your JavaScript. Um, but I also believe, and we'll talk a little bit about code organization. You'll see I have my CSS right next to my component. Like I, I kind of like <coughs> organized by component or feature or whatever you want to call it. Uh, type thing, so uh, at no point in this project am I really going to have a CSS folder by itself. Um, we're, we'll, we'll certainly talk more about that. Uh, okay. Yeah, I feel like I'm doing all right. You guys ask good questions. Uh, so linting, everyone knows what linting is, right? Does anyone not know <coughs> what linting is? It's about including semicolons everywhere. Everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. And uh, on, 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 on the semicolons one, that's an error, too. It doesn't build. <laughs> no warnings on that. Oh, that's right. Uh, so linting is pretty straightforward. And what we're going to do is take a really quick look at um, your basic linting. Um, there's really specific linting for uh, React. Uh, especially, I, I definitely recommend right now using the, uh, the hooks linting. They've got like a special package just for hooks. Um, and then, and then I've also got here a one one linting or a one one y, which is accessibility. I'm a huge fan of that. It's an easy win. It's a little difficult. Uh, so, like, if you have a large project and you throw this in there, you're going to see your code just start barfing up into the uh, console. Yeah. And if you really want to be an advocate for this type of thing, you need to take the weekend and fix all that shit for your team and show them how to do it going forward. There's, it's really a lot of very simple rules that we're all breaking all the time. Um, you'll find that you know there's certain things you end up that become kind of painful. It's like if you put an on-click on something, well, it's got to have an on-key yeah. press. 
you write a little wrapper for that thing. You end up with a key click component that just fixes that for you, and you're done. Like I've done that. It's not as bad as it seems, but when you first set up accessibility linting, it's gonna look fucking ugly. Like it's just gonna, it's just gonna scream at you like crazy. What's that? Every child needs a key. Well, that's yeah. Well, that's React, and uh, you need to do that, man. We don't like about that one. <laughs> um, Okay, so we're going to take a quick look at this. It, it's going to be kind of the same process. You know, I'm going to install some packages. I'm going to, uh, uh, that guy running, take a quick look. Uh, what did I say that was? Oh, All right, so this one was really easy. I know you can't see this very well, but uh, I'll jump to the code in just a second. But I created an ES lint file. Uh, I've got some uh, what, what would basically be like ESLint presets compared to like our Babel presets and our, our uh, uh, what was the other one I just, uh, the, the CSS, the post CSS oh, presets. Uh, you can just throw in like Airbnb is this and the recommended ally that and so on. Uh, I kind of like to see what's in there and I'm very aware of the fact that while Airbnb may have a recommendation for me and uh, whatever the, uh, the accessibility one was, which is JSX Ally. Uh, I'm sure all that stuff's good, but I have to be reasonable about what my team can and can't deal with or can and can't get done. And there's certain things that may be errors that I need to make warnings. Like I want my team to be aware of it, but we understand it's a problem. Let's just have it keep yelling at us, uh, but we have to keep moving forward and, and we'll always have that in mind. So uh, the defaults may be more strict than you're ready to deal with. And the other thing is, uh, just while I was made, like putting this together, just kind of branching off the previous branch on this thing, um, libraries have updated. I mean, in the same day, <laughs> uh, shit changes. Some of these things that are in the preset make it deprecated. Um, and you're, you're kind of back and forth on that. You can keep your preset up to date without knowing what's in it, or you can keep a list of all the rules there and you need to know that some of them are going to change. So now you kind of need to pay attention to what all those rules are. 90% of the time, that's just going and looking up a specific rule that doesn't seem to be doing what you want it to do or is showing up in your editor for some unknown reason. Uh, so the, so I added, uh, oh, you know what? And this is the one I messed up on because for whatever reason, I didn't add the packages until later. Um, but I do have them in here now. So we'll just take a quick peek at that. It's going to be hard in this view for me to distinguish exactly which ones I added, but it's Babel ES Lint. <clears throat> it is uh, all this, all these ES Lint guys. So ES Lint config React app, which is uh, a bunch of like specific to, actually, you know what? I don't even know if I need that motherfucker. <laughs> um, the ES Lint loader is, uh, I'm using that in Webpack. So when Webpack does its development build, uh, if I have something wrong that I've, de I've, I've designated as an actual error, it will not build. If uh, it's something I designate as a warning, it'll output a warning. We'll, we'll take a quick look. And then just a bunch of these little guys for, uh, 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 you know, importing those plugins or presets that I was talking about. And then uh, what do I got here? Like three presets, the React, React Hooks, and the JSX <coughs> accessibility one. Not positive that I need that config React app. I'll check that out. Uh, so if I jump over here, I don't think I have any errors in here right now. Uh, so I just, just for shiggles, want to make sure kind of everyone gets to some degree what's going on here. Uh, so let me just reload this guy over here. Try to get all this on the page. We're really just looking at the console right now. Don't worry about whether or not you can see the app. And I just need to break something. Uh, so yeah, okay, so let's try accessibility really quick. So on click, not how you spell it. God damn it. <laughs> All right. Can you code? <laughs> no. Glad I'm not doing that. Right. So a <clears throat> couple things are happening. My <coughs> editor is yelling at me like, hey, uh, you know, there's something wrong here, and here's the specific rule that's having a problem. The click events have to have key events in this case. 
meaning that mostly it means you need to be able to get around this with a keyboard. If you just have it on click, that's not, and, and because it's not a button, 90% of the time the solution to this problem is use a fucking button. <laughs> it's yeah, focusable, it it's key pressable, it's clickable, you don't have to do anything extra, but if you're trying to do an on click on a div and you want to keep that thing accessible, uh, even if I put a key press on here, later it's going to say you need to be able to focus it, which means I need to give it a tab index of zero most of the time. Um, I've got this set as a warning, which means over here, whoever's working on this code makes this change uh, is going to see this in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the console there. The person who reviews this pre PR is going to see that in the console too, and there's going to be an agreement between the team, like, is this something we're solving? <clears throat> but I would say 100% of the time, leave the warning there. Somebody will get sick of it enough. To, uh, to finally deal with it and, and make your site accessible. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's a nice, easy one. Accessibility is, I mean, it sucks, but it's new to all of us. I don't mean accessibility sucks. Accessibility is awesome, but it's new to most of us. Uh, it's, you know, it's been around forever. We talked about it way back when XHTML and uh, Bobby 508 certified and all that shit. And just, you know, there were a couple really strong advocates for it 10 years ago. And now we're realizing, like, oh shit, you can get sued. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like you need to have this stuff. And uh, as JavaScript developers, it, it kind of falls on us now to, to implement that. No design people are implementing accessibility, other than you know, putting the wrong colors next to each other. Um, however, semicolons. <laughs> if I miss a semicolon, not only do I get a little red squiggly under that guy, that's right. Because I'm running it through. Webpack with the ESLint loader, it refuses to build. So I said that one's an error. <laughs> <laughs> the Webpack won't even build that shit right now. Production. It, yeah. It, it, <laughs> oh, okay. So so it, 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 it takes one dollar out of your paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, I love it. So I, I, I'm not really a stickler for semicolons, but they exist, uh, <laughs> and uh, they're they're there anyways. Is kind of the thing. And if I'm going to have an argument, it's going to be about shit I actually care about, not semicolons. And if I can have a little reminder automatically in my IDE and before I commit any code, and it tells me exactly what line to put it on, what do I give a shit? It's fine. Some of them yes. are a little excessive, but who cares, right? They're, I mean, I think you were the one who said it like a few weeks ago. What do you call it? Uh, automatic semicolon insertion? Oh, yes, uh, yeah, automatic semicolon yeah, insertion. So, Behind the scenes, it's always uh, This is already insertion. happening. Like, you're just you're being forced to do it. Anyways. Pretty out of hell. Something to go to hell. At one point, the TC39 actually recommended that you use semicolons, and a bunch of people freaked out. <laughs> you, if you've read the uh, Jacob, was it Jacob Thornton and uh, Douglas Crockford on, on on GitHub having the conversation back? I don't, I don't know if I have. Oh, look that up. It's an <laughs> argument between, uh, I want to say it was Thornton, but it's one of the guys from Bootstrap and uh, Douglas Crockford. <coughs> And he was saying, because Crockford has like a linter. And the person was saying, like, your shit's broke. And uh, he showed Crockford a very reasonable situation where you should not have to have a semicolon. And Crockford told him, your code is stupid. I'm not fixing my linter for your stupid code. And then boom, it just blew up. It went on forever. It's, it's amazing. It should be in museum. You can find it. I guarantee you a simple Google will get you there. And I think it's Jacob. Thornton or Thor Thornton, something like that. One of those guys. Uh, so this is what the ESLint file looks like. If anyone's not familiar with it, it's pretty straightforward. I do have a parser here for Babel ESLint. I don't even remember why I need that. Uh, and then and then I've got all the rules right. And uh, at the bottom, I've got my plugins at the bottom. I think you can put those at the top. But basically, I'm just kind of breaking down each one. Uh, you know, zero is zero is nothing. Wait, is it zero is nothing? Who the fuck knows? Oh, I can tell you. Where's the semicolon? <laughs> all right. Anyways, all these numbers mean different levels of warning, so you can just figure them out and have fun with that. Uh, and there, and oh, you know, and just really quick, uh, one that I did mention, and I just want to point out really quick. Where was it going to use effect? So everyone's familiar that hooks are a thing in React now. If you've used React, right? Hooks. So this is the use effect hook. And uh, so there's this, these linters specifically for React hooks. And uh, one of them is like, well, if you're going to use it in the body of use effect, um, 
you need to, to have it in that little array at the end. If you're not familiar with the use effect, anything that you throw in after the use effect function into this array, uh, the function won't run again unless one of those items changes. Right? Understand? Mark, you don't, you don't write code. I don't care. Oh, okay. I don't care if it's useful. <laughs> Yeah, it is useful. It's it's it's, so useful. it's not. It's kind of you know what it is kind of like an observer. Not not. It's I'm thinking of MobX. It's kind of like with MobX. Like when you create a computer value, it only runs again. It's uh, uh, it's kind of like like a, like like memoizing kind of like it's it's it if only it runs, runs again, if something changes. That's it only it only runs if something in that array at the end of it changes. So like. Basically, it's saying it's an observable uh, those things. Yeah, and something. It's, a, it's a dollar dot watch. Anyone know what that? Is? Oh, actually, I know what that is. <laughs> See, why didn't you say that? I thought you would, I thought you would get that. Um, okay, so that's linting, right? Uh, again, these are all like just little things that I keep adding. But you know, if we take a look at our package JSON, and I'm sure, and I know I've got this weird like uh, plugin that's telling me like, which if I'm on the latest version or not. But like from where we started, we had like a few Webpack plugins. We had React DOM, prop types, and React. Like this is growing, and uh, but it but it's been growing just like through these little steps that we've been making. Like we need these fucking things. We got to have some way to use CSS. We we want to be able to catch errors early. Like we need this stuff. So this is going to grow and grow and grow. Uh, but a really cool thing is like when you do this yourself, not only do you get to choose like the latest and coolest shit. You also kind of become the person who, like, you kind of become responsible for that shit. Like, yeah. you're the person that knows every bit and piece of it, uh, or at least you're going to have the, the the shortest path to a good lead on what's going wrong. Uh, and that's kind of a double-edged sword. You get paid more, uh, but you also get calls at random hours. <laughs> um, so that's linting. You got to have linting. You got to have it. I'm not. I'm not trying to give you any or tell you about anything you don't need. Uh, all right, I don't remember what 05 was. Let's see. <clears throat> you also have to test. <laughs> uh, I don't even think I need to, I can just run the test on this. So uh, this, again, very simple change. We added Jest, which is going to be our test runner. And I'll go to the chart for you really quick, because I mean, you should use it, right? Uh, I skipped over something, because I'm not going to do type checking, I'm not going to do TypeScript. If you want that type of type checking, use TypeScript. It has won, flow type is dead. Uh, ReasonML is, is coming on really strong and claims to be maybe a contender for that type of thing, if it's what you want. Uh, I'm on the fence about TypeScript myself. I, I lived through CoffeeScript, and uh, I, I have like post-traumatic stress disorder from that. I don't, I don't and, and, and with the way uh, ECMAScript is moving, I, I've been able to hold out this long because I'm always like, it's coming. A lot of that stuff is coming anyway. It's like, why do I need a, a lot of people like it. It's, it's clearly not a awful choice. Uh, I just don't personally <laughs> use it. I mean, if a job said, hey, you got to use this, I'd be, I'd be using it. Can I drop a quick disclaimer on that? Yeah. If you use TypeScript, a lot of the other stuff Joe's been mentioning might not work uh, yet. <laughs> like hot, hot reloading, for example, if you try, if you do React, create React app with TypeScript, hot reloading is off by default. Uh, I talked to one of the developers. They're like, "Yep, doesn't work. Don't do it." We tried for a while, and then it broke. And well, anyway, uh, and then like linting is a little weird as well. Um, so like like the Fuchs rule that he was talking about, we can't use that with TypeScript. So it's they're working on it, but again, it's always a little bit behind on that stuff. Yeah, there's there's TSLint, but then TSLint's going away soon, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, Babel has made like a huge jump forward with like the, the oh, yeah. compiler built into it or whatever, right? So I mean, yeah. there's it, it's there's, happening. It's just yeah. always a little yeah. bit behind, like just yes, but it's still really good. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I will say, much like CoffeeScript informed JavaScript, TypeScript is informing mm -hmm. uh, JavaScript, and I think there's something like two or three different proposals already out there for uh, uh, optional typing. Nice. So. We'll probably get some form of typing in JavaScript someday in the future. Uh, so if you, if you can hold out that long, maybe you don't have to go down the TypeScript rabbit hole. Uh, so uh, so again, I'm skipping past that. We're talking about unit testing. Uh, Jest is going to be our test runner. It's pretty much the one that you want to use, especially if you're in the React ecosystem. 
There's built-in React testing utilities. They're awesome. You can do a lot with them. There's Enzyme, which was pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> it, it really was. It was. And, yeah. and, and, and the really weird thing is it's not that React testing library is so much different. If you haven't caught on, like, the orange ones are the ones that I'm picking here. Uh, and I recently had to write a wrapper that would allow you to use either Enzyme or React testing library because we were switching from Enzyme to React testing library and we weren't going to rewrite all of our tests, so we just wanted all new tests to be rewritten, and as we had time, we could rewrite the old Enzyme ones. Uh, React testing library isn't really a replacement for Enzyme. Has anyone used Enzyme? Has anyone? anyone? Okay, has anyone used React testing library? Okay, so it's all the same people for both of them. <laughs> uh, so Enzyme gives you access to like the guts of your component. You can just reach in there and get the state and do all the stuff. Like you have access to the entire, like whatever you made available in that component, you can get into it. Uh, React testing library really tests the DOM, like the DOM rendering of your component. So whereas Enzyme, you can say like, hey, just put my component in this state, right? Put it on on, right? Uh, with React Testing Library, if there's not a way to do that in your rendered UI, you can't do that for the most part. So it's it's a really different, uh, it's a shift in thinking. But I will tell you, while Enzyme seemed really powerful, really really cool, everybody eventually started struggling with it. Like it just it got really cryptic, and then you need different adapters, and it's uh, it did its job. It got us this far, but I think React Testing Library is kind of the winner right now. But you know, it doesn't hurt to write yourself like a little divorce library from that guy too, because there will be there will be something else. Um, so for that one, uh, I really didn't have to do too much. I mean, I had to write a test, right? Uh, so just really quickly, while I've got this here, uh, uh, and this is the one where I screwed up and I added all the ESLint stuff later. But all I had to do was add Jest, uh, a thing for Jest to understand the CSS modules that I was importing. Uh, something called Jest DOM, which is really what we're using to test that DOM. Uh, Babel Jest, because Jest doesn't understand all the stuff that we can do with Babel, so you have to have Babel transpile it for Jest, otherwise Jest is going to be like, that's not even JavaScript, or whatever. Uh, and, and React Testing Library. And there was one little thing I had to add here called Identity Object Proxy. Uh, <coughs> everybody who uses this has it, and uh, I'll try to explain it if I Tiny. All right. Well, you know, I think I'm gonna read. Okay. So here's my test. Just so you know, uh, I wrote one test. It's called app.spec.js. It is in fact right next to my app component. This is the dumbest test. This is the thing that you write when you just need a test. It just says it rendered without crashing. I'm not actually testing anything. Um, but I mean, this is what uh, using Jet and React testing library look like. Uh, you will see, and I have been victim to it and, and uh, victimizer with it, uh, where I've brought in other libraries, Synon and Chai and all this stuff. <laughs> Jest has all that shit. I mean, it's got expect, which is your assertion library, if you're okay with it. And then for a lot of the Synon stuff, it's, uh, you know, usually you're creating some sort of spy or stub. Jest has all that stuff, you can just do it there. So I didn't really need anything extra here. React testing library is just making it easier for me to actually, you know, render the component, and I could do some clicky stuff here and whatnot, but I'm not at the moment. Uh, but this is a test, right? And I installed Jest. And uh, for Jest, I needed, and that's what I'm missing here. Oh, there it is. This is my config for Jest. Um, most of this is just kind of boilerplate stuff uh, where I needed to tell it to run the JavaScript through Babel. I needed it to uh, allow me to bring in those, the way I'm bringing in CSS. If you don't have this line, it barfs all over. It's like, I don't know what you're doing. And this one, I really forget exactly what it does. <laughs> but you need it, and if you don't have it, it's going to break, uh, along with the, uh, the idea of like trying to import those CSS files. Between those two, the just CSS modules and the identity object proxy, all of a sudden it starts working. And I didn't make any of this up. Like, you just go find when you try to set this up, oh, my CSS won't import and Jest is barfing about it. Uh, this is the solution that you will find on like Jest website or an issue in GitHub or something like that. And so um, Jest will go through and just run all my tests, right? So, uh, and you know what? We haven't really been taking a, a look at uh, 
the uh, package JSON, but I added a script called test, and just to show you. Um, so it doesn't only find my one test, which I haven't you know done well on, uh, but it, but I found it ran it everything my test pass. I just don't have any sort of coverage here, and it's also looking like hey you got all these other files. What the fuck? Where's my test? Uh, you can exclude files. I do it now and then. There's some stuff that you just you don't. That's how you fix unit testing. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just, just turn them off. <laughs> yeah. uh, I actually think I covered this a long time ago. But one really cool thing about Jest is it comes with something called Istanbul. So this coverage directory that's up there, and I know it's really really tiny, uh, has a, a file in there. It's index.html file that just got generated for me. Um, so I automatically get this little Ruby report, and I can jump into. And this will, you know, over time show all of your tests. Uh, but you can actually jump in and get all this information about which lines of code were covered, which ones weren't, how many lines, or how many times a certain line ran, uh, all that good stuff. So just like just gives you that for free. React testing library is the one that we're using to test our specific React components. It's super easy, and uh, much like a lot of the stuff I'm talking about here, it's just something you should do early. Just like get it in there, everyone start writing tests, people will get more confident with it. Uh, you'll feel more confident reviewing a team member's PR if they've got tests there. Uh, so it's just, you gotta write tests, you gotta do it. Joe, I noticed, I noticed you were getting my test ID. I know, yes. I know. So Cyprus, it's a good point, go ahead. So I was gonna say, I like Cypress recommends is the best practice to use test ID, and it seems like, that just seems like becoming a good practice to yeah, prefer. so actually Cypress has test ID, and React testing library specifically has uh, uh, data dash, I think it's test data ID. Data dash yeah. test ID, So, yeah. so uh, and I'm glad you pointed that out. The, the two recommendations are actually different, but because you have to do it a certain way for React testing library, I recommend doing it the same way in Cypress. And Cypress is data the dash, next thing. I think it's data dash sci for Cypress. Yeah, so, so one thing I ended up doing here, um, is you can see in order to run my test and kind of go with the convention that React Testing Library is putting forward is I'm, uh, things that I need to get at instead of like doing like a, some sort of uh, direct DOM um, query, I've been adding data dash test ID. So this data attribute and React Testing Library has a function in it uh, called get by test ID and you just give it that value and it'll automatically get it. There's a whole bunch of information about why we should do it this way. I think I agree like 85% with it. It's mostly like uh, we don't want to be messing around with our classes. Like leave those alone, let people do whatever the hell they need to do. This is something that for the most part should be remain unchanged to some degree. Uh, you'll run into weird scenarios where you have a whole bunch of components on the screen and you know, uh, now you're, you know, it worked really good for React testing library, but now with Cypress, it's like, which one? And now you might have to get a little more selective about that. But so, so I did actually have to come back uh, and change some stuff in order to, uh, not in order to write my tests, not in order to run those tests, but to do it the way the library tells me to do it. And I, and I think it's a good way. So. So you recommend just using the one ID for both? For Cypress and uh, for, uh, for a React testing library, yeah. It's it just, otherwise, now you have three IDs on this guy, <laughs> exactly. one for Cypress, one for that. Yeah. Uh, Is there a Webpack plugin that rips them out in the production days? I, I almost guarantee you there might be. <laughs> so just throwing it like out there. Like 90% guarantee. Steve, open source project for you. There you go. Yeah. So that I want to run a Webpack plugin <laughs> Data ID's got you down. <laughs> uh, so, so one thing I've kind of been skipping past a little bit is like what's been happening with this package, Jason. Not much has happened. Obviously, we've added a bunch more packages, right? That's given. Um, but on this last go around, I also added an extra script. So it's just a test script that reaches out and runs that just config file through just. No big deal. Um, yeah. So uh, I don't even need to load the app for that one. We are going to jump right ahead. Uh, this one, we will load. Oh, yeah, we'll run that. Shit. What have we really been doing? Oh, God damn it. <coughs> All right. <coughs> so. 
to make sure I'm in sync with the chart. Okay, so I've got a bit about prettier here. And I'm going to skip it. <laughs> no, no, I will tell you that if you go to our YouTube channel, Ernesto did a great talk about it. If you don't know what prettier is, uh, just install it and use it, and uh, it's 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 style uh, code style formatting. Um, you hook it up, pre-commit. It just it formats your code in a way that we can all agree on. You won't love 100% of the things it's doing, but it just eliminates the argument. It's just it's over. Use prettier. There's a couple. I mean, there's like four settings maybe you can configure. So you can argue about those. And one of them is where to put the brackets on JSX. <laughs> I, I don't even think I ever even look at it anymore. I just don't care anymore. I can write my code any way I want. I hit commit and it fixes it in a way that everybody agrees on and I don't have to argue with anybody and I don't give a shit. And I even, I even now use it in my editor, which is crazy. Um, so we're gonna skip that, but use Prettier. Everyone use Prettier. Uh, integration testing, Cypress.io. Nice shirt, buddy. Um, Integration testing has always been a huge pain in the ass for front-end devs. Um, it's also been something that in a lot of larger companies just ends up falling on back-end devs for whatever reason, because uh, there's better libraries in Java and shit like that to do it. Uh, but now we have Cypress IO, and I, I, you know, you are really seeing a shift. Like As front-end devs, we can take full control of that, and, and engineers can do it. We don't need a special QA person to do that, like a good QA guy can tell you if you're doing it right or if you're testing the right things or if you're doubling up on your unit tests and your integration tests. Uh, but we should just be writing these things right alongside with our regular tests. Um, you know, at, at some sort of interval there, I'm sure, you know, you write a component, you're not rewriting your entire integration test. Um, but Cypress IO is really easy to use if you're already writing any kind of uh, unit testing. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, it's a no-brainer. So I'm running the application here. Uh, I installed Cypress, there's no big deal, one line, uh, and I'm going to, so I'm, I'm going to run Cypress against my development server. I didn't have time to like create a production server and run it against that, blah, 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 blah. Uh, things. Uh, so I've got another script in there, and I just, you know, want you guys to see this, so I'm going to say Cypress, uh, open, yeah, of course. Run. I'm, I'm coming off of yarn. <laughs> you should do a talk on that. On what? Why yarn is better than NPM. It's not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should do a talk on that then. <laughs> there was like a brief moment, it kind of was, and now it's not. <laughs> Why? Didn't it used to be way faster? It was faster. It, it, it had certain conveniences that we just, you know, we don't really need anymore. And, um, okay, so uh, I did Cypress open, which actually gives me like a little UI. I can actually see this thing in the browser. I have one test. I'll, I'll, let me show you the test really quick. Uh, so when you... Uh, so when you set up Cypress, it actually gives you, what's kind of neat about the first time you run it, I deleted it all, but you get a, uh, like a ton of examples. Like it's just like, here's how to write this kind of test and that kind of test. Um, this is my test. Uh, uh, it's it's, it's going to go visit our app and click on the button. Because all that scientific stuff that we filled out, I don't know if you know, it didn't actually, get, when it said computing beep boop boop, that was fake. Not, uh, yeah. <laughs> so all you gotta do is click the button, and then it's uh, it's gonna go get the image. And, and without like really harping on Cypress, um, it's friggin' awesome. And you, if you've used other things like Selenium frameworks or Protractor back in the day, or <coughs> even stuff like uh, Casper and Slimer and Phantom JS and all of that stuff, uh, there are all these assertions. You know. You, check to see if a thing is there, and then you make sure it exists, and then you make sure you can click on it, and then you click on it, and then you, all this stuff. With Cypress, like this git, like this line right here where I'm saying get this thing by that data test ID attribute, um, exist is implied. 
there's a time out there. Like if it doesn't exist, my test will fail. Um, so it will wait a certain amount of time, and I can extend that. But you don't see like in a standard Cypress testing suite, you do not see a whole bunch of wait 1500 seconds, wait two or uh, milliseconds, wait 2000 milliseconds because I know something's loading. You just write the shit out, and the assertions are built into it. They have assertions that you can use, uh, shoulds, and you know all that good stuff. That's totally acceptable to make sure something has text. But you almost never need to just check to see if something exists, and you almost never need to wait for anything arbitrarily. Uh, so it waits for the DOM to like finish updating, which is yeah. Cool. It does have a time limit, but it's very reasonable. Um, and you can, they do have like, they have a wait, right, Tom? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you have yeah, a wait. Have you, a wait. Can, yeah. you can like mock your server. You like can talk call. Call. You right? can see us, my talk is up on uh, YouTube somewhere. Yeah, so if you want to learn more, actually if you want to learn about almost all this shit that I'm touching on, we <laughs> probably have a video on it. Uh, so I'm just, in the UI thing here, I'm just clicking on it. It's going to go do the app. It clicks the button. It does its awesome algorithm. We get a picture, right? So it just did it for me, that test passed. Um, I can also do that just in the terminal, which, which I really don't need to wait for if time was. Just so you see, is anyone uh, is anyone here using Cypress? That's almost like <laughs> Puppeteer. Those two guys? Is it almost like Puppeteer? Uh, Puppeteer is a different beast. Yeah. Puppeteer. So syntax-wise, Puppeteer is old school. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it doesn't necessarily have. Oh, this kind of allows you the TDD also, so you can you play sure. your test and then you... Yeah, you really run into, especially like with front-end engineers really taking ownership of this stuff, uh, you really run into, you really have to learn what your unit testing versus what your integration testing, like you really have a balance there that might not have been there before. You need to make a balance that might not have been there before. Um, because you will, once you get into Cypress, you'll just, you'll be the person who's doing it. It's so much easier. And, and, and smoother for the person writing the component to write the unit test, to write the integration test with the tooling we have today. I would not say that was the case even a year ago, well, two years ago. Um, so, uh, so Cypress ran, and I just, now I just did it in the terminal. So uh, we're gonna talk for like two seconds about CI CD. That's what this is for. You know, like it doesn't need a UI. That other UI thing that I showed you with Cypress is fucking badass. I mean, you can cycle through it. You can see the history of the thing. You can inject stuff. You can do anything you want to do in the browser. You can have a, uh, a, a test that has many, many, many steps, and you can just jump to one of them and get a snapshot of the DOM at that point. It's crazy what you can do with Cypress. It's awesome. It's nice. um, huh. Actually, so, that's, that's, it, yeah. Yeah. go ahead. Can you? So Cypress you can use as part of CI CD. So you have to use Selenium. And you can use Jest. So I use I use Jest right. when I use Cypress. Well but the way we use Cypress. Use, I mean would weird. Cypress run with like Phantom JS or something? I mean, it runs with Cypress? Cypress is the runner. There is no Phantom JS. It's a totally new thing. It's not based on Selenium, none of that stuff. It is its own self contained awesome fucking thing. Right, so it's not gonna work in IE. <laughs> it, only runs it does not support IE right now. It actually only supports Chrome, Electron. That's I know it supports Electron because it's one of the options. That's it. Uh, yeah, they are working on Firefox. And Edge is on the way, baby! Apparently when they just got the Chrome branch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that's 100% that's true. I, I probably should have pointed it out, but Cypress is awesome. And nobody uses IE, and Edge is going to be Canary. And now Chrome is the new one. So, uh, I'm, I'm not going to no, show. No, oh, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff for Maybe I missed it, but can you explain, like, what does, for me as a developer, what does Cypress tell me? Like, what information does it uh, give me that I want to God, I want to find, like, a, like, the, you know, all unit tests, no integration tests mean. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, unit tests I see, right? Like, it tells me my code yeah, so did this, and now it doesn't do this. and. So, so like the classic example is something like where you have like a window that opens, right? Uh -huh. And uh, and unit tests all work, it all opens, but then you put two of them together like this, and now you can't open either one of them. That's integration testing, right? right? And that's somebody who didn't do integration testing. Um, so, you, and this is what I was talking about earlier about like you kind of got to find that balance. Like if this is if this really becomes your responsibility. Unit tests are unit tests. Like test the functionality of the component. Right. Try not to repeat it in integration testing. 
there will be gray areas. There will be areas where it's easier to integrate test or integration test than it is to write unit tests. And you know, you, you just kind of got to find your way through that. But I mean, overall, integration testing is testing your application as a whole, all the components yeah. together as a whole, okay. rather than the individual component itself. So what's what's an example in like a component that you would use that you would want to test with another component? Like I, I get the window. Any two components together. <laughs> yeah, but. <laughs> Or you might have like a drop down um, search or something. Yeah. And you might have a drop down component and you uh -huh. might have the search one. But you want to make sure the overall component. I see. When I sure. when I type here, the select box the, only has got it. the ones I type. Okay. So, it's, so you might build them up. Yeah. And that I might see. be part of an editor. And maybe you want to be sure if I select. Right. You know, you, know, you could dream up something. Like Makes that. sense. Yeah. That's absolutely it. Like testing a component is maybe a small part. But in its actual use, it could be a small part of a very large, you know, yeah. piece of so uh, the reaction of your using your component, how it, yep, the yep. other so, uh, like you know, you're it. testing the on-off state of a button, but like that button inside of some giant editor yeah. of some sort, or you know, yeah. some some <clears throat> larger application with a lot of UI components going mm -hmm. on. Integration tests is saying like, does the shit all work together the way the customer or the user is, is supposed to use it? Got it. Um, okay. So I'm not going to go into CI/CD because I couldn't come up with a quick example. But um, does everyone know what continuous integration is? Continuous integration is when I push a piece of code, automatically run all my tests and tell me if that code could be merged into master or you know staging or whatever it is. Um, so that's the CI part. CD is continuous delivery, uh, and that's you know how quickly can we get our code to our customers into production through those phases. Um, and I, you know, here's the process. I, I, I believe it's something that we're starting to see more and more with straight up front end applications um, that are communicating with separate back end applications that don't necessarily live in the same repository and do not need to move at the exact same velocity. Um, decoupling those is, is, is a really great thing that's happening. You know, there's a coupling, you need to know what's going on, what version of the API you're using, but not having to wait for the .NET guys or the Java guys to, you know, get back from lunch or whatever. Uh, it, it just push your code, um, but in order to achieve that, you do need some processes in place, and uh, it's you know you've got some sort of shared repository for your developers to write code to. All of these tests, the the uh, primarily, especially the unit test, potentially the integration test, should be running at that time uh, in some sort of environment, um, and that's where magic is. And there's a million ways to do this. JS. There's, like a, there's a ton of ways to do this. You can do this for free with open source projects with uh, <laughs> Travis CI. Circle, I think Circle, Circle CI has a free thing. Azure DevOps. Uh, DevOps. Azure DevOps. Uh, Jenkins, which is free, but there's a lot of setup. I ain't got no love there. No. <laughs> uh, so there's lots of different ways to do that. But the, but the idea is like, you know, this is certainly something you want to look for. It might not be one of the things you need day one. It really depends on what we're talking about, but this really becomes a part of that developer experience. Um, like I can write code, I don't have to sit here and manually run all my tests and figure it out. Like just right there in GitHub, give me a little check mark. At least get me that far. I would, I would definitely say continuous integration is certainly the first step of this. Continuous deployment or delivery or Whatever is, you know, that ends up getting a lot more complicated. You've got a lot more choices, but it's not that hard to get something to automatically run your test when you upload code to the repository in a, in a pull request. And the, the next person who comes along can be like, "Yes, your test passed. I'll bother looking at your your PR. If your test don't pass, I don't bother looking. At it. Right. No, unless I'm bored and I want to tell you why your test isn't passing. But I would not count on me for that. Hey, so you've got like 20 minutes left. How are you going to get through all that? I run out of stuff. No, no, we're fine. Uh, I'll, you just tell me when to shut up. Because yeah, I, I probably won't make it to the end of this. I have more shit to talk about. But you can do that next final. month. Stop we, now. We don't have Stop somebody. Stop now. Oh, we're grooving. This is backup talk for the future. All right. So really quick, we are going to talk about this part that I called application core. Um, and you know what? I'll just kind of skip through a few things, okay? I can jump. Yeah, you literally have like 20, 25 minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Does anyone want to get up, hit the bathroom, grab a beer, a piece of pizza? If you do, okay. I'd rather you not skip through this stuff though, and like go into it in detail, you know? Okay. So we're I want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, okay. Right. No, okay. That's all the out of the box. That's what I'm saying. Right? You I, get the keys. Right? I'd rather this be like part two next yeah. time. 
with well, when we have the wrong color. Right. Two hours again. Yeah, I, I can stay until my hard drive fills oh, up. Are we gonna rename you, like Michael? Like, like, no. Michael. Michael. Uh, so, as part of what I'm calling application core, this isn't you know necessarily writing components. This is like how your developers are gonna interact with your application. Well, not with your application, with your code base. Um, state management. You can do a lot of stuff right now with context and hooks. It's awesome. Use reducer, use effect, use state. Uh, you will, depending on the type of application you're writing, even though like use layout is really like, like ah, you're never going to need this. You fucking need that shit. <laughs> um, especially if you're doing anything like very heavy visually, uh, especially like a lot of SVG stuff. Like you need window resizing and stuff like that. And you need to respond to it. Use layout is awesome. It's the same as use effect, except it waits until the DOM is like, ready to go and then gives you the information or runs right before it flushes it to the DOM. So you could, could get something like, what is the scrollable height of the window going to be when I have all the shit? Um, you can do a lot with context and hooks. I don't think we're 100% there that anyone is like totally sold on the idea that Redux is dead. Um, I'm personally a huge fan of MobX, but Redux is the winner here. Like. Uh, in terms of mine, what do you call it, Mindshare? In terms of uh, bringing people in who already know it, uh, it wins. Uh, I will point out, and it was like the very last branch, uh, there's this really cool thing from the guy who made MobX called Immer, which makes Redux a lot less painful. Um, so, Are things kind of moving away from Redux? I, heard well, that's what I was saying, context and hooks yeah, yeah. gets us really close. Uh, React has become much more capable of managing state across, uh, like shared state, I should say. Uh, but just I need middlewares now. Yeah, we just need middlewares. <laughs> um, I, and what I was saying is, like, I don't think anyone is 100% sold on that yet. Okay. But there's a lot happening there. There's a lot of cool stuff coming out. I think a lot of us are oddly, for whatever reason, connecting like all this use hook, or all this hook stuff. With yeah, but you've also been promising suspense for a long time. Like, when is that going to get stable? Um, so there's there's a bunch of things coming that we're kind of, I don't know. For me, I'll believe it when I see it. So Redux for now. Redux is the winner. I, I actually prefer Mob X personally, but not. It's just it doesn't really have the traction that something like Redux has. Okay. There are definitely two distinct camps between what's called Mob X and Redux. And, you know, they throw shit at each other all the time. But okay. at the end of the day, Redux is, is king. You can't do anything about it. Um, but yes, there's a lot of new stuff around hooks and context and React that uh, have people writing articles saying uh, Redux is dead. And it's not. OK, okay so I'm going to go back to our awesome component. And, oh man, I made that really, really small. Uh, you guys probably don't even remember this component anymore. Um, but uh, my little loader thing here, the beep boop thing, still using state. But I've gotten all the state out of my, uh, my other component. It no longer has any state. Because I moved it on to a really uh, shoddy Redux store. Um, so if you're not familiar with Redux or the purpose for state management, it's to be able to share uh, state amongst a whole bunch of components without having to send the, the value of that state down and down and down through a large tree of uh, React components. Um, so I just moved it up. Uh, this is a thing you do. At the end of this guy, and, I'm, and I did a really poor job here, just so you know, uh, I've just I brought in uh, React Redux. Yeah, React Redux, I'm using a little connect guy to share the state from my store to my component, and then this got kind of tricky, because I don't think you would normally do it this way, but I also wanted to keep the little hot module reloading. So I just did it all here, like a dumbass. Um, and now, all of that state is now part of my prop types for my component. So I'm just pulling it out of the store and dropping it into this guy, and there it all is in all of its glory. And then I'll show you really quick, all that's, I mean, I think I just wired it up in one file. So I took all that shit that I would call kind of my source of truth, all the things that was generating the labels and how that was all configured. This is all like made up bullshit for me. Like this is just nonsense. Like you don't have to worry about this. It's not specific to Redux. And then here's my one reducer. If, if you get lost in Redux, 
because I I get lost in read. Anyone else get lost in Redux? Like once it like once almost every example is crazy complicated. Yeah. Um, so this is what a reducer is. It just it takes in a state and typically an action, but just another argument, and then typically that other argument has a type if you have more than one thing you can do in your app, and then you just update the state according to that action's payload, whatever that action is giving you, and you end up doing all of this stuff that we're all super proud of because it's immutable. And uh, we, we spend, as a community, a lot of time trying to make immutable shit in JavaScript. We don't have immutability in JavaScript. But we make it up. Just make more copies. <laughs> yep. Uh, and so you know, so this is it. Uh, that's it. Honestly, that that's in a nutshell. Uh, before you get to middlewares, because anyone anyone who's like writing a large Redux application right now is looking at this, being like, "Well, you got to use you know thunks or sagas or you know uh, Redux observables or Redux promise or something like that." Like it gets crazy and complicated really, really, really quick. Uh, some of these libraries, though, they do. I mean, the whole point of them is to make it easier to do this, to try to have less boilerplate. But if you're using Redux, you're going to have a fair amount of boilerplate. Um, there's ups and downs with that. It's very easy for somebody to come along and see, oh, I need to create this file, and then this file, and then this file. Uh, it's like MVC almost, you know, uh, in order to create this new view. Whereas uh, some of the other libraries, or MobX for the most part, is, is much simpler. Um, and the Immer thing, if I get to it, I'll show you, because I just rewrite this reducer using Immer, and I just get rid of all the immutable bullshit, and it becomes readable all of a sudden. <laughs> Actually, I will make it a point that before Mark tells me to shut up, I will flip to that branch. How will you know when that's going to happen? Because <laughs> uh, you're a nice guy. It's still like six minutes. Like, 8 o'clock has got to be about, about it, right? About, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, does it say yeah, but it takes some people like forever to leave. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna move on. Oh my god! Come up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you liked us. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just a hater. All right, so uh, data fetching is it sounds stupid, but you kind of need to figure that out at some point. Okay. Um, uh, some of that is going to be defined by you know what you got to work with. Uh, I threw a couple little things in here. Axios seems to be really popular. If you like using Axios, it's probably a perfectly good way to fetch data. Um, in our little application, I'm just using fetch, uh, which needs to be polyfilled to some degree. Uh, super easy polyfill. You just drop that guy in the, the, I forget all the WH, whatever the hell it is. Um, Swagger right there in there is an example because he maybe handed something that you're supposed to use, some sort of like, here's your JavaScript client in order to access the API. That happens. Um, I was recently working on a project where you had three different teams giving me three different Swagger JavaScript clients to work with their three different APIs. And uh, most of them didn't know how to maintain the Swagger YAML, which is the file that generates all that shit. And so we just abandoned it all together and wrote our own kind of Swagger thing, our own client for all the different APIs that worked out much better. If you're lucky or unlucky enough to be using something like GraphQL, you may be able to use Apollo Client. And, and uh, my understanding is you can use a lot of that for state management anyways. You might be able to kind of skip over the Redux stuff. Uh, we're still in the application core. <coughs> Routing is, there's no, it's React Router. Uh, there was Reach Router, but if you've heard recently, Reach Router is basically, React Router is going to become more like Reach Router, and, and uh, Ryan and Michael have made up. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, there's no there's there's no other that one you don't have to think about if you need routing in your React application. Does anyone know of any other router that you would use? There used to be a few, but I think that's it. Right, we're done. It's React router all day. Okay. Uh, localization. I'm actually going to show this one because I think it's really important and it's something people don't do until too late. <laughs> and you might as well just get it into practice, like nobody should be hard coding English strings into UI. Class names, IDs, nobody gives a shit. Um, but actual strings in your actual UI, they shouldn't be there. And you, if you, you want to start off on a good foot and like you're thinking long term down the road, uh, don't do it. Just so you use localization or internationalization. So um, there's a bunch of options for that. <coughs> I am just going to show you the one that I like right now, which is called AT Next. 
Um, there is a React library for this guy, but I'm not using it uh, because I wasn't in love with it. It kind of it seemed a little overwhelming to have to wrap all my things, so I just wrote like a little translate thing, and it's fine. Uh, so I'm going to run this really quick. Whoops. Oh, I have it in another one, another tab. I'm stupid. Sorry. You guys are supposed to say you're not stupid, Joe. I'm the stupid, <laughs> stupid. I'm the stupid one around here. Stop that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is our app. I'm gonna reload this guy. Kill off. This. No, I'm gonna need the dev tools. All right. English, right? Mm -hmm. Everything's in English. Um, however, what I've done, and I'll show you the code, is I've removed all of the English uh, hard-coded strings from this, and I can prove that by coming over here. Uh, so I don't have a little toggle or anything cool like that. I didn't build any of that. Um, but the library I'm using will um, automatically detect or try to detect the language of the browser, and then uh, or your browser, uh, and then it will throw that in the local storage for you. Uh, so when you come back, it doesn't have to detect it. So I'm going to change that. Apparently, uh, if I did this right, it was either E, no, it was E-L. For some reason, Greek is E-L. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Um, so, does anyone here read Greek? <laughs> no? Yeah. That's why you did it. It's just <coughs> crap and we don't know it. I actually pasted each and every single word into Google <laughs> Translate. <laughs> and it back on my thing. Um, wow. so it's all there. It didn't take that long. Why is it building the resource? All right, so that's a good question. Um, let me get to this mofo. All right, so um, <clears throat> I've got. I, I, so I set this up a way that, like, I was already familiar with doing. Um, but in this case, I'm, I, one thing I'm not doing is I'm not loading the um, lo the language JSON files separately. I'm actually just sticking them right here. Uh, you would not. Uh, you would not do that mm -hmm. in production. So, like, I'm actually just throwing them in right there, so they're just always available. Uh, you, they, this particular library actually has one that's all like another package that's all set up to load it from the back end based on what it needs to request. So I just did this very quickly, uh, and and that's it, right? Uh, so here's my files. That's all the all the crap that I had in the store before. I took all that out, and now I just kind of cycle through it and, and I'll put that information. I can show you how I did it in the store. It's pretty pretty straightforward. But these are all the strings in my application, right? And then these are all of them in Greek, except for the ones that don't have translations, because some of the words are made up. Yeah, boop has no trans translation, and uh, kaleidoscopy is not a word. You could have just put anything. I did. I put all the same thing, and I was like, it has no variety. I don't, I don't like it. Um, so, so in my application now, uh, again, you know, class names, data IDs, that's, you know, you can't do anything about that, component names. We got to name them something, but there are no hard-coded English strings in this any longer. Uh, everything is running through this little translate uh, thing that I made, and you can tell it like ideally which key you're trying to get from off of your JSON object, so you can get to it quicker. And then you know, like here, where I used to have the word computing, T computing, uh, it doesn't matter which language it is to me, uh, and it also fall back to English in my case if it can't find it. Uh, so. Really, really easy to implement. Uh, I did do one little, in order to avoid using uh, the React library, I have this little translate thing, which looks really complicated, but like, it wasn't that hard to create this from their examples of how the React stuff works. So, but there are React components. You can just, wrap, there's like a React IET next library. You can just wrap like a translate thing around something. I just felt it was a little cumbersome, and what if I want to change it? <laughs> So I had to add a few libraries for that too. Our package JSON is is getting pretty big, but I, I do want to kind of keep moving because I know Mark's got to go home or some shit. It's like five minutes. Uh, so that's localization, right? And now we're getting to so that's application core uh, interface. This these next two areas are going to be pretty light because this is all subjective opinion shit. This is where you argue about and stuff. The rest of it wasn't. <laughs> no, the rest of it is like. Uh, real decisions you need to make without emotion. You really need to think about like the future of your project. How many people are going to be working on it? Are you trying to hire people? Are you trying to grow your team? Are you the one stuck with this shit? You know, I, I think all of that stuff 
that I was talking about previously, and a little less so in the application core, like which state management library you're thinking about using. All of that stuff up to this point, a lot of it is developer experience. Um, it certainly has to do with like release cycles, without a doubt, at its core, release cycles. Re fast release cycles are good for engineers. Engineers uh, uh, releasing quickly or having a, a better developer experience than somebody who you know, has to wait a week for, for their code to get approved or <laughs> debugged or some shit. Um, so release cycles are a part of the developer experience, but having all this shit at your hands and having those patterns uh, to, to help you code faster and cleaner and just know the path forward is all developer experience to me. So interface. Um, <coughs> we don't have any actual UX people in here, do we? No? Okay, good. Uh, so UX people always want to create frameworks, CSS frameworks. They all think they're CSS developers now, I guess. Um, and they want to reinvent the wheel all over the place. Uh, I, uh, so, so that's, that's like pick a CSS framework. And what I'm talking about is not bootstrap. I'm talking about what I would call an atomic framework like Tachyons. I think Tailwinds comes really close to that. There's more and more of these popping up. And I just want to show you this really quick. Uh, so right now, I have not switched to the next branch. Uh, here's my component, right? Here is the CSS for that component, okay? This is the CSS for our little application, primarily. Uh, over in the index CSS, I set the body and, and I created that little variable color just so we had something to look at, you know? Um, but this is it. Uh, I'm gonna jump to this other branch where I brought in something called Tachyons. And even in this code, I'm only using a very small part of Tachyons, but Tachyons is a CSS framework, library, whatever you want to call it. It's one CSS file. It's got a whole bunch of shit in there um, that, that works at what we kind of call the atomic or functional level. So it's a lot of little class names that you string together. I like it. Utility CSS, they call it. Yeah, utility CSS, functional CSS, object-oriented CSS. Well, it's not object-oriented, it's not bad. Uh, atomic, <laughs> functional, and uh, utility, I think are probably the best words that, that describe something like this. So, yeah. All right, so with this, again, I won't waste time going through the package JSON or anything like that. Uh, this is my CSS now, okay? The application still 100% works, and I, and I don't just, just, I don't wanna, you know, lie to y'all. So, I'm the, it, I don't even think it looks even, I don't, I think there's like a minor spacing difference when I reload this, uh, but not enough for me to be upset about. Yeah, it's a body margin or padding or something, but everything else is the same. There might be a couple little bits off here that I could live with or I could work around or I could tweak. But, and you know what, I'm gonna kill this and get English back here. So, everything works, right? There's our English, we all feel better. Um, so how do, how do I get rid of all that CSS, right? There was, there was a whole, you saw it, there was a shit ton of CSS here. Uh, it's, it's just inline classes now for the most part. I mean, 90% of what I was doing in there was a bunch of Flexbox stuff. So now it looks like this. You know, there's like these little utility or functional or atomic classes that just uh, eliminate the need for me to write the same four or five Flexbox commands or properties over and over and over and over and over again. And you know, there's a few things to learn here. If anyone used Bootstrap back in the day, you learned all that shit. <laughs> this is pretty easy. It's it's all you know. Padding a or p a two is padding all level two. There's a value for that. If I wanted horizontal, I do an h. If I wanted top, I do a t instead of the a. It takes some time to get used to, but uh, who wants to write this shit? <laughs> you don't have to think of names for what do I call a class that includes all this stuff? Right, right, right. right? Exactly. So. This is, again, a, uh, a subjective, picky choice of mine, and I think that's where this kind of stuff lives and works best. Uh, but I'm a huge fan of stuff like this. It does not have to be tachyons, uh, but it's certainly a really simple example to go look at. And it's got a whole bunch of, I mean, these things can get really crazy and long, and you can do uh, all sorts of uh, uh, media queries inside of there, and, you know, or well, not, you can do responsive design inside of there. They've got all that stuff, it's awesome. Uh, oh, there's only two more branches. And you have minus five minutes. Minus five. 
but I'll have to tell you. Uh, yeah, okay. I hear you. All right, real quick. Really? No. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's attitude. <laughs> yep. All right, so I'm going to skip component libraries versus custom. I don't have anything for that. Uh, it's kind of the same thing with a lot of UX designers on that, on that concept. Um, you're going to get a lot of people who want to reinvent tooltips, who want to reinvent pop-ups and type aheads and all that stuff. There's some really good, solid component libraries out there that I, I would implore you to go take a look at. Even if you have a design team that's saying, no, we're going to make our own, all our own shit, find something you can take and skin that thing. Because the, the, the design team is thinking about how it looks. They're not thinking about every conceivable use case for this thing. Usually, my biggest breakdown between my self as a front-end engineer and somebody who's drawing the pretty picture, doing you know doing their job as a designer, is they don't think about window resizing, they don't think about scrolling. It's it's almost like you know they're designing for print, and there's there's a million other things we need to take into account. And if they have a really great looking tooltip, there's a good chance that there is a component library out there that looks a lot like a tooltip, and you could use it. <laughs> Uh, one that I've really become a fan of, especially for, for quickly getting moving, is Semantic UI React. Yeah. There's a CSS uh, uh, library and component set called Semantic UI, and then there's a React uh, Re Reactified version of it. It's awesome. I have used it in production products, and uh, uh, I've wrapped it up a couple times when I really need something to, to work a little bit differently, but they've done a tremendous job there, and they, uh, they keep it pretty straightforward. I don't know. It's, it's been really easy for me to work with, and I, so it's kind of my go-to component library right now. It does not have everything. It's, and it doesn't, I don't think it has anything responsive. Uh, but, I mean, it's HTML, right? Okay, so I think on this, this next one, which I'm calling performance and debugging, and I kind of also want to say it's like maintenance. Um, this is like as you guys are moving along, you know, you're, you're cranking out code. You, you need some of the stuff to, to find uh, uh, performance issues and, and to debug. So I've got a whole bunch of, like a whole mess of stuff in here. And one of them is called Bundle Analyzer. There's a Webpack plugin. I've got it uh, set up here. I'll show it to you. Uh, called Webpack Bundle Plugin Analyzer or something like that. It'll basically show you what your bundles look like. In our case, I've split mine in bet uh, between an app.js and a vendor.js. And so I just added the little library. And this is like one of those things that I think is uh, like just such an easy win. There's re if you're using Webpack and you know, you're doing some sort of bundling, there's just really very little reason not to do this. So again, I'll, I'll end up putting all this code up online or on GitHub or something. As long as you know how to switch a branch, you should be able to cycle through it. Or you can just jump to the last branch. Um, but if I set this up right, I installed the, the Webpack plugin. I added it to, uh, I should point out, I actually created a separate uh, Webpack uh, config for this. So we, had, we always had common development and production. Now I created Analyze, which I cheated. I just I used the Webpack merge being in production, and then I just add this bundle analyzer plugin to the plugins. So that's it. That's my, my third or fourth thing. Uh, so I just run npm run analyze, which is a script I added to the package JSON. It's going to run that guy. It's going to. It might already open it. Oh no, there it goes. Any? Oh, it gives me this right, uh, which is a little confusing at first, but the bigger it is, the the bigger it is. Yeah. Right? Um, so the good news is this is my app JS right, and then this is the vendor, and. Uh, where, where you really, really, really see it, and everybody in here has probably seen something like this, is when you need to deal with time, there's <laughs> a specific library that everyone likes to use, and it's called Moment. And we use it because it's, it's fucking awesome. It's great. It's yeah. Except it's massive. And it comes yeah. with every locale you could ever need. And so there are like, uh, I, I made a mention of it in my chart. Like, I, d I didn't actually say anything about it, but. Um, one thing that you should be aware of way back here on Babel is uh, library specific plugins. So there are Babel plugins for specific libraries to <coughs> maybe a library is structured that like on its import it imports every goddamn component it has in there and you don't need every component. You're only using one or two. Uh, same thing with Moment. There's a, like a Babel plugin of some sort that will strip out a lot of the stuff that you are not using. Okay. We are done, except I'm going to show you Immer really quick. <laughs> <laughs> that was the promise. That was the deal. Yeah, no, that's what I said.
Yeah. Minus 12 minutes. Uh, I'm not going to bother show. Oh, oh, error monitoring. Does anyone do that at work right now? You got something like roll bar? Roll, is that bar. roll bar? Yeah. Uh, so this is the thing that like you, you add a script to your code that reports any JavaScript errors to this service. You get an email about it that you start to ignore. Um, you, can, you can tie it into all sorts of stuff. But you, you basically check it once a week and say, say, like, is anything really, like, really going wrong? And then you check to see if you know, that's a testing machine at work, which it usually is, or some dude you know. Uh, and you just, you know, it's a, it's a way to find out what's happening in production, little bugs that are coming up. State management dev tools, I was gonna give you a quick look at Redux dev tools. It's not that big of a deal. It just shows you all the changes that are happening in your application. So the last little bit I wanted to show you, even though it seems like it's unimportant, is this thing called Immer, and I'm not showing it. Uh, I'm not showing it to you to, uh, to say you should use Immer, but I do think this is like another really important part of No, I just I was on the wrong tab. So what I was going to say is um, I I'm not showing this to say like hey run out and use Immer, even though I th think you might want to. Um, I'm showing it because a, a part of this whole process, like you get through all of this, like this could be weeks and weeks and weeks of your time, and this could be something that you're building up over time, and you're you're kind of making these decisions with your team, hopefully along the way. But you know, at the end of the day, if you're the one in charge of this, you know, you're going to get blamed for it, so you might as well go with what the fuck you like. Um, <laughs> but it also implies that you're going to be on top of it, and so you need to find. Uh, not only like cool shit, like I spend a lot of time, any code base that I'm in, if I have free time, like I, I, I adhere to time to lean, it's time to clean. So I'm either beefing up our tests or most of the time what I'm doing, and I don't get to achieve it often enough, is I'm looking for 10,000 lines of code to delete. Like I wanna delete a bunch of code that like, or I wanna write some awesome component that all of a sudden everyone on my team is gonna be like, holy shit, like this is solving problems all over. Like I'm looking for that all the time. I dream about that. I almost never come up with it. But every once in a while, something, you know, but at the same time, you also need to be looking at what's happening out in the world. So Immer is one of those things. Um, you know, earlier we were looking at the store file for our Redux store. And uh, oh, one thing I didn't really show you that I did here was I, I was going to talk about organization. I organized my components. I organized my store. I put shit. It used to all be in the same folder. Uh, that giant app component. It's no longer one giant component. So I've got like all these little components for the checks and selects, and now it looks much nicer. You know, what, once this, once your JSX gets to a point that it's hard to like reason about and think about, it's too big. Make make smaller components. I mean, that's just the rule. There's no num line number on that. It's just once it's too confusing, once you are scrolling down and all the way back up to the top to figure out what the fuck's going on, your component's too big. Uh, so the store. If you remember, this was our reducer, and we were doing all this awesome stuff to have immutable data. Um, the store is identical, except I'm calling it reducer with Immer now, the reducer. Um, and all you end up doing is taking in your same stuff, and from Immer we get this thing called reduce. I actually think it's a dig at Redux reducer. This is the producer. <laughs> and what's cool is um, it takes in that you know state and your action and everything just like it normally does. Uh, but you have this thing called a draft, and it's a copy of the state. It's a, it's the next state, and you just change it. Mm. You don't. Uh, so so, I should have kept the uh, commented out code. So like, here's a really simple one, right? All I was doing is changing the the state uh, key of loading to whatever the payload was, right? That's all I was doing. But I was trying to do it in a mutable way, and this is how we do it. And here, I don't bother. I just I just fucking change it. It's done, and it's immutable under under the thing. Like you, you can go read about it. It is doing immutable awesomeness. Uh, and 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 uh, Dan Abramoff has come out and tweeted like this is awesome. It makes uh, reducers way easier to read. So I don't I don't think there's like a little win for uh, people struggling under the weight that is the religion that is Redux uh, greater than this one. Like it's us. Awesome. Uh, and then same thing here, like the other one, uh, you know, that was a little more complicated. And these, my, my producer here is super simple. But like on this guy, you know, I had to go through a couple extra steps to get into that key of config and then, you know, put the state config back on, but then spread my new payload onto that. And instead of that, I just I wrote a for each, you know? And actually this one's better because now I can deal with more than one 
value coming in at once. Just for each and upload, update the thing and be done with it. And, and that's it. Uh, there's like, what, the what, kind of interesting thing is you're now returning the producer. So I ended up having to go back to breaks on these unless I'm just returning an unchanged state. So there's some, you know, there's some little bits in there to learn about, but that's it. And then uh, I did add on the uh, the Dev Tools now. Uh, there's a Redux Dev Tools extension if you're using Redux, and you got to do all the window triple underscore dev shit now. It's 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 a bit easier, and this actually comes with something that's more handy if you're using a bunch of middleware called uh, Compose with Dev Tools, I think. Yeah. So. Woo! I think I'm done, man. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Are you sure? No! Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. That was awesome.